Well, thank you for coming out on a Monday night in the rain. It's nice to have you here. We're moving through uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel this evening. Uh, we'll see. We won't get all the way through Ezekiel. There's a lot of material there. We're looking at just eschatology, just putting the pieces together. This, I think, our 12th class. Uh, we start in Genesis and just keep moving through, talking about things that are talking about the end, about Christ redeeming man, coming back, setting up his kingdom. And then, of course, we've got several questions as we look at it. Is what kind of a kingdom is it going to be? Is it spiritual? Uh, you know, how, what does the, the resurrection look like? And so we just put together a lot of pieces. We're also doing this on Tuesday night because we had some questions about that. I've got a, a new chart I made last. Uh, this, I'm still working on it, but i got a little chart I'll have for the wall tomorrow night, which I'm kind of excited to, to unveil and try and get it hung up correctly. But... Uh, we're looking at Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and a lot of the things that we're going to see tonight are going to be similar to what we see. Ezekiel's going to have a lot of new material, but Jeremiah's going to have the basic ideal of the captivity that, that's coming. Now, in, by Jer in Jeremiah's day, Israel, the northern kingdom, has already gone in the, in the Syrian captivity in 722. But uh, in the, Jeremiah's predicting there's, the, the captivity, there's going to be a 605 captivity, a 597, and finally a 5. 86 B.C., a captivity of, of uh, the tribe of the nation of Judah going into Babylon. Uh, then Ezekiel is going to be taken captive himself in uh, this, uh, this, this second captivity. He's a priest, and he'll be 30 years old uh, and will be called to be a prophet there in Babylon. And so Ezekiel will be prophesying in Babylon... Uh, between 597, or, you know, it's 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 in the some of the years are the one of the verses we're looking at tonight are going to be 585. So these he prophesies before the captivity and then continues to prophesy after the captivity there in in uh, Babylon. But that, they talk about the captivity and that there's good, of course in Jeremiah that's not what we're looking at tonight. But Jeremiah spends a lot of time saying it's coming. But then there's also going to be the restoration. You're going to see the restoration of Israel, a promised restoration. That restoration, remember, is not the return from Babylon. Uh, that was Cyrus saying to people back to rebuild the temple, but they'd be taken captive and dispersed again in 70 AD. This is the ultimate restoration where their heart is going to be changed. And that's going to come up in Jeremiah 31, where we talk about the new covenant that God is going to make. There's nothing God can do with man's heart uh, in his condition. He can teach him, he can plead with him, he can discipline him, he can give him rules and laws, but man's heart will always rebel against God. He's going to have to give him, as it says in Jeremiah, a new heart. And when he gets this new heart, uh, he'll be able to have uh, the law written on his heart, he'll be able to have the Spirit of God, he'll be a new man, he'll be, a, can we, we say, born again. Uh, and so Jeremiah talks about that, uh, the new covenant. And then also the Gentiles. They're talking to, all this is coming through the Jews, but the Gentiles are always mentioned. We saw it in Isaiah several times, and we're going to see it in, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The Gentiles are also going to be brought in. So God's work of salvation is not just for the Jews, it's through the Jews. And that's exactly what was told Abraham, that all nations will be blessed through him. And so we got now, starting in Jeremiah 16, verse 14, uh, Again, we, we've covered Jeremiah, we've gone through it verse by verse, and there's a lot of great things in the book of Jeremiah. You can put it in a historical order. It's not written uh, chronologically, but you can take a real good guess at putting it in a chronological order. There's always going to be questions about some of the chapters. But we're just looking at uh, the things again, talking about eschatologically in the future. And so, let's begin, like say, in chapter 16. Uh, verse 10, when you tell these people all this, and they ask you, why was the Lord, why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster against us? What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? Then say to them, it is because your fathers forsook me, declares the Lord. And now he's talking to that generation, of Jeremiah's generation that's going to be going into captivity. And followed other gods and served and worshipped them. They forsook me and did not keep my law. But you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers. And that gives that's the, the decline. You maybe have the first, second, third generation, but now they are in the fourth generation. And so their fathers behave badly. And again, Ezekiel makes it very clear: people are not judged for the sins of their fathers. That's not why they're judged. What takes place is if if a if a generation or a son repents. They, they come back to God. But if they continue 
there's going to be a decline. And that's where you got the four generations. And so this is their, their fathers have forsook the Lord. Well, then they train the children this way, and they just took it. They don't even, they, they leave the question, what, what have we done wrong? We don't even know what we did wrong. It's like, well, that's how far gone they are. And he says in verse 12, But you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers. See how each of you is following your stubbornness of your evil heart instead of obeying me. So I will throw you out of this land, that's the Babylonian captivity, into a land neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. Then verse 14 is kind of what we're looking at. That's what's going to take place in Jeremiah's day and to this generation. However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought, us, brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he has banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their forefathers. So again, that could be Cyrus's restoration of them coming out of Babylon, but it says all the countries. And again, that gives that idea of the future where all the nations will be given up the Jews and they'll be coming back to the land. But now I will send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, that's going to take them captive, and they will catch them, and after, I, after that I will send for many hunters and will hunt them down in, in, on every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rocks. My eyes are on all their ways. They, have, they, have, they are not hidden from me. And talks about you know, all the things that they have done. Um, let me read that last... Um, then he goes over to the, the next uh, verse 19. Uh, this is probably indicating the Gentiles here where it says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the time of distress, to you the nations will come for the end, from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers possessed nothing but false gods, worthless idols that, that did them no good. And again, that's the Gentile style of worship is you know, just the pagan gods. It would be the... The, the Canaanites or the Romans or the Gentiles are up in Europe or you know the Egyptians down into Africa all, all of them go to the east they all follow the pagan gods and it says that, that they, it says uh, um, the nations will come and say this that their fathers possess nothing but false gods worthless idols that did them no good do men make their own gods yes but they are not gods therefore I will teach them this time I will teach them my power and might then they will know that my name is the Lord, or it's capital letters, so Yahweh. So there's that reference there to the Gentiles. Not only are Israel going to come back, but even the Gentiles are going to be brought to the Lord. And that's chapter 16. Again, what's interesting about that set of verses is it's, it's, it's already, I, you learn nothing. I mean, I mean I, you can learn always, but it's like we already, that's been established in Isaiah, it's been established in Psalms. You go back to Genesis, that's just the same thing. So Jeremiah is saying the same thing. The, there's going to be a dispersion, there's going to be a restoration of Israel to the land, and the Gentiles are also going to come. So Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Again, we're just skipping the verses here because like in 21, it talks right about, there's, there's Jeremiah talking to Zedekiah. And you can notice this is out of order, chapter 21, because Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, and now we're only in chapter 21, so you know we, we, we go back and forth in, in time. Yeah, as, as the chronology, as the book is laid, laid out. Uh, chapter 23, verses 5 through 8, it's, I've got on my notes, it says, uh, the, the promise of the righteous king, and his name is going to be the Lord our righteousness, and then the regathering of Israel. Uh, so you're going to see the same thing, but we're going to add to this now, uh, there's going to be a righteous king. They, there's, there's so many wicked kings after Josiah in uh in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah and Josiah worked together. He was a king. He got killed about age 40, uh, trying to stop Pharaoh Necho from going up and helping the Assyrians uh, against Nebuchadnezzar. And then he had a series of sons, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. Jehoiachin was Jehoiakim's son. And then finally, the last one, Zedekiah. So there's after him is going to come three of his sons and one of his grandsons. Uh, Jehoiachin is going to go into captivity and, and live in captivity in Babylon and have be a guest at the king's table and have sons and, and continue uh, the line of David. Uh, but uh, the, those kings were evil, but there's going to be, in the future, is going to be a true righteous king. Now again, when we talk about this, this righteous king, we're talking about Jesus Christ or, or the Son of God, and he's going to be known as uh, the Lord and then our righteousness, which, I mean, it just, 
that's exactly what he's going to do. That goes right back to the same ideal of the new heart. I mean, you're going to have to have a righteous king. And who is this king? Uh, he's going to be the Lord, our righteousness. He, he's going to be our right. We're not going to be able to achieve what he's done. He's going to have to do it for us. So chapter 23, um, oh, we got verses 5 through 8. Uh, I'll just begin in chapter uh, 23, verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Again, now, again, this is one of the problems is the, the, the leadership is misleading the people. They're scattering them. They're, they're leading them the wrong way. Uh, they're using them for their own benefit. And that's the comparison. The, the leadership of Jeremiah's day is, is corrupt. And he says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of the pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pastures. There's a restoration where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will they be missing, declares the Lord. Verse 5. Now that, I mean, that's, you know, I'm going to get rid of the people, but I'll bring them back and give them good leadership. But now we kick into eschatology. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch. Again, that being genealogy, a, a righteous son. A king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Again, right there, it's like, is this just any king? Well, no, this is going to be Yahweh, who is our righteousness, who is the king. So the king, the righteous king, is going to be the Lord, who's going to be our righteousness. And that's going to be the reason why the people will be able to live with him, because he is their righteousness. He's the Lord, who's their king. So you can see all of that. It's, it's the line of David. He is righteous. He is Yahweh himself. He's God. But he's going to be the righteous that the people are going to need. Um... So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the south, north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. Again, there's that idea of something greater than the Exodus is going to take place. Jeremiah 30. Now you can see as we go through this list, uh, Jeremiah is a great book. Uh, I, I really enjoy teaching through Jeremiah. Um, it's very historical, a lot of historical references, a lot of connections. We've even found names of people in the book of Jeremiah on the, the boule or the bula of, of sealed, the, the seals on documents. So again, it, it's very historical. They, they found many things. Uh, but not a lot of eschatology. We, we've touched on some basic things. <clears throat> Already been in chapter 30 and 31. It's kind of, you know, you can see on your notes, that's kind of the end of it. But beginning in chapter 30, uh, it's going to talk about the restoration of Israel to the land, that Israel is going to serve God. And again, the reason they're going to be able to serve God is they've got a new heart in chapter 31. They're going to have the new covenant, or God is their righteousness. It's not their own righteousness, they've been made righteous. Um, but also, it's going to come up in this chapter, and you've got to take it serious. David, their king, will be raised up, uh, and th they'll serve him also. So they're going to serve the Lord, but David comes in. Now when you see David, it's like, well, what, what could this mean? Well, it, it could be a reference to you know a son of David. It could be a reference just to the, the throne of David, maybe to the Messiah. Or it could be a reference to David being resurrected himself and coming back in, in the kingdom age. And I think that's where I'm going to... That's what I believe. I, that's right, you know, I weigh out. And you can see the verses are coming here, chapter 30, verse 1 through 11. But you're going to see the same thing in Ezekiel. When you get to Ezekiel, David is in working with the Lord in the, in the, the temple, in the sanctuary. David is there. It's like you've got the Lord. David is the king, but uh, the Lord is the king of the whole world. So, I mean, it's almost like David is the king of Israel, but Yahweh, or, or Jehovah, Jesus... Is the Lord is is like the emperor of the world, and there's many kings in his empire ruling under him. But anyway, keep that again. That's the way I understand it. But you know, you got you got to somehow explain. Here we go, chapter thirty, verses one through eleven. 
This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, and again, you can see that's Yahweh, the God of Israel says, Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord. That would most likely is, is the distant future. When I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their forefathers to possess, says the Lord. Again, that could be the return coming out of Babylon, or it could be the distant future return. And again, the coming words will help explain it. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob but he will be saved out of it. Now, right there, you recognize that verse, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not talking, or it could be. I mean, the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon would be, would be similar, or the fall of Jerusalem in, in, in by the Romans. But this right here, the time of Jacob's trouble, many people understand that is talking about Daniel's 70th week, what we call the tribulation. Because, again, he talks about you know, the, the days are coming. Uh, Jeremiah is, is made it very clear that destruction is coming in Jerusalem. He gives them several options out of it. If you turn, go, if you'd uh, surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, your city will be spared. You'll go into captivity and he'll rule you, but he won't burn your city. But they continue to rebel. And finally, it's like now he's going to burn your city and your temple and no one's going to be left. And so that could be these days, but as you read this, this is talking about a day in, in the distant future, the day before Israel's restoration. So now we can add to the idea of, of Israel coming back into the land that there's going to be a great distress the days before that recovery. Anyway, in that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will, the, will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now, as you read this right here, it talks about that time of trouble, Jacob's trouble. And again, that could be, that could be uh, you know, the Babylonian destru destruction. But notice, the Babylonian destruction is, is judgment. God is tearing down and sending him into captivity. This trouble that they're talking about right here is trouble that's coming, but the Lord is going to come and deliver them. There's going to be a deliverance from this trouble, and he's going to bring them back into the land. He's going to give them a king. He's going to raise up David. So this trouble, you know, it talks about how, how dreadful it is. Again, we can read this. Again, it would apply to any destruction. Anytime your nation's falling and your cities are being overrun, Cries of fear are heard, terror not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Why do I see strong men with his hands on their with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face is turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be! None will be like it. That sounds like you know Matthew and Luke. There's there's no day like this. It will be a day, time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Okay, right there, you see. In the time of trouble, the time of Babylonian trouble, they weren't going to be saved. In fact, Jesus, we're going to talk about this again tomorrow night. But in Matthew, Jesus talks about the destruction, and Luke talks about the destruction. But in one case, he says the destruction is coming, and these are the times of the prophets spoke about where all the judgment for all the prophets will be fulfilled, poured out on Jerusalem, and there's no deliverance. Another time, in the same set of verses in the, uh, the other gospel, it's like, now, when the, you see that happen, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, now you need to look up because salvation is drawing near. So, with Babylon, Babylon in 586, Jerusalem in uh, or, or Rome in, in, in 70 AD, those are times of destruction. When you see the armies coming, your city is going to be burned. <coughs> but there's this time in the future when you see the city surrounded, Look up, because your salvation is right there. And this doesn't sound, as you read this, this doesn't sound like Babylon when they're destroyed and taken cat to, to, cat to captivity, or Rome in 70 AD where it's burned and there's been a dispersion ever since. But when, the, when you in this grievous time, no day like this, the Lord will save them out of it. This is talking about coming out of the tribulation and 
what we would say, the second coming. So here it is, uh, again, in that day, verse 8, the day of trouble, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks, you know, deliver Israel, and tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve Yahweh, the Lord, their God, and David, their king. Now remember, David has is, is been dead since, you know, let's say 950 uh, uh, B.C. Now this is, say, 600 so it's been 350 years David's been dead. And now it says, They will serve David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now, it, it, the first time when David was raised up, a shepherd was raised up to be the king. He was raised up from the people. He was just a mere shepherd. He was raised up to be their king. Well, now David's lived. He's been king. He's been dead for 350 years. What does it mean? I mean, unless you're going to go metaphor, he's going to raise him up. I mean, clearly we're talking... When this all takes place, when the Lord delivers them out of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of the tribulation, and brings them the land and the king, and David, well, that's when that's the resurrection. So David will clearly, when the second coming, David is going to be resurrected. I mean, I, obviously I'm reading a lot into this verse, but you've got to put this into perspective. It's because it's not Babylon, it's not Rome. The Lord's delivering them. It's 350 years after David's already been raised up from being a shepherd to being the king of Israel. He's been dead. But now on this day, he's going to be raised up again. I mean, what does, it represent, what does that represent? Or is he talking literally about a resurrection of, of David? And as, you know, our doctrine, you know, we believe when the second coming occurs, that is part of the resurrection. Um, instead, of, they will serve the Lord, their God, and David, their king, whom I will raise up for them. So do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, O Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile, Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scattered you. I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. And so, then, okay, the next verse is interesting too, verse 12. This is what the Lord says, Your wound is incurable and your iniquity be beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause. And then he goes back and starts talking about their sin nature. It's like, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. You can't, I can't fix this. And that, that's why he's going to have to come for salvation. Jeremiah 31. And this is, again, one of the great chapters of, uh, of Jeremiah. Um... Oh, the, the verse we want to look at is in chapter 31, verse 31. And if you just want to look right there, chapter 31, verse 30. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. That, that, and we, that's exactly the verse we're talking about. That's, that's Ezekiel's going to make a big deal about it. And we'll come back. We should talk about that real quickly. But that goes right in verse 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And again, that's very important. That this is now introducing here the concept of the new covenant. Because I, we, from the beginning, from Genesis, every Bible hero, and this has been kind of one of our themes during the study, every, every hero is, 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 has a problem with sin. They, they can't do it. They can't deliver themselves. They can't be obedient. They can desire. They can seek. But... They're always going to stumble because they've got sin. The only thing God can do is, is save them, give them a new heart. And he's given them uh, you know, some promises. We've got the covenant, uh, we call them unconditional covenants. You know, the Abrahamic uh, covenant, you know, God is going to give them the nation. He's going to give the Palestinian covenant, or the land covenant, he's going to give them the land. He's going to give David the throne. He's going to have a son of David sit on the throne. These are unconditional covenants. They're basically promises. I'm going to do this. You can't do anything to help this happen that's going to, going to take place. So we call those unconditional unconditional covenants, or basically promises. The, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, even the covenant he made with Noah. Um, then you've got the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant was not unconditional. It was a conditional. You obey, you'll get blessed. You disobey, I've got to punish you. 
So this is not a good covenant. This was a covenant. I mean, it, it got them established. It taught them the word. It, it gave them uh, some, the rituals that, that taught them what was coming. But what they need, this, this covenant, the law, the New Testament calls this the law, cannot save them because it's, it's based on their obedience. And, and it's, they're always going to fail. So God realizes this fact. He's going to address it. And this, this is what's important about this verse. Because right here in the Old Testament, Moses alluded to it. He even says, there's a prophet going to come like me. You, you've got to listen to him. And he, he tells the people this. Well, right here, Jeremiah is going to say, uh, this covenant is not going to work. It's not going to help you. You're going to need a new covenant. And this new covenant, and then Jesus picks up on this, and if you know this, you, you see it right away at the Last Supper. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. I mean, he takes the cup of the bread, this is the cup. It's like he's, he's sealing the new that was promised. He's sealing it there with the, the bread and the, the, the wine before the crucifixion. Because this new covenant is going to be the Lord our righteousness. He is the one that's going to do it. And he's going to give them a new heart, and you're going to be able to be saved. And now in this condition... The Spirit can come, you can have fellowship, and it's going to be God's life in you. And you, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. And this is why, at this point, you know, in this discussion, some people, well, we should, we, maybe we should follow the law of Moses. It's like, well, I mean, if you want to do it for dietary reasons or some kind of an exercise in, in learning the Bible, it's really, but it's, as far as your relationship with God, this was a failure from the beginning. It was a teaching tool to get you to the place of where you realize you need this. And so once you've got this, this doesn't even make sense. I mean, it's, it, a lot of times you hear people, they get caught up in bad teaching. And it's nothing different than the Galatians got caught up in. They want to go back to the Mosaic Covenant. Anyway, here's that new covenant. So I'll leave that there for right now. Here's that new covenant. And if we look in chapter 31... Um, Well, I'm just seeing, I should read all this, and you can read it on your own, but all this stuff about what's taking place in 31 is just the disaster that's coming. And uh, and Jeremiah is, is having, you know, he's going to fall asleep. Um, and he's having a dream. Let's go to verse 23. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. When I bring them up back from captivity, the people in the land, I'm in Jeremiah 31, uh, Verse is it 23? When I bring them back from captivity, the people in the land of Judah and in the, its towns will once again use these words: "The Lord bless you, O righteous dwelling, O sacred mountain." People will live together in Judah and all its towns, farmers and those who move about with their flocks. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Then in verse 26, at this I woke and looked around, my sleep had been pleasant to me. Jeremiah, who was actually in, in prison at that time, or in the, in the guard palace court, and I mean, under arrest, he'd fallen asleep and had had a dream, and it had been, well, it had been a, a pleasant dream. The days are coming, declares the Lord, that was part of his dream, when I will plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the offspring of men and of animals, just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down and overthrow and destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant. In other words, that's how Jeremiah's book begins. Is is going to send a prophet to tear down and destroy, but then later he's going to send him to build and plant. Verse 29. In those days, now this must be a saying from day, the days of Jeremiah, because Jeremiah and Ezekiel, in fact, Ezekiel would have heard Jeremiah preaching before he was taken captive in 597, just like Daniel as a, as a teenager would have heard Jeremiah teaching before he was taken in the first captivity in 605 B.C. So both Ezekiel and Daniel were familiar with Jeremiah's teaching, probably had his scrolls or his some of his writings with them or available to them in Babylon. And they were taken in 605 and 597, so they, they know these things. And so this, this saying, what's interesting is Ezekiel chews the people out because they're quoting this proverb, this saying, because they're telling each other the reason we're in captivity, again, they would have been the fourth generation that were taken into captivity. And they get over there and say, well, it wasn't our fault. It was, it was our father. I mean, does this sound familiar? It's not our fault. It's our fathers did this. They established some bad practices, some bad principles, and now we're being judged for it. It's our fault. The reason our nation is in this terrible condition, it's not our fault. It's 
the founding fathers' fault. They made all these drastic mistakes. What what are we? We're doing nothing wrong. We're trying to correct it. We're to, and it's like in our in our culture's attempt to correct it, we're we're becoming worse. And that's no different than these people. And so, verse twenty nine. In those days, people will no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now basically you understand what that means is if the fathers did something, the children got the reaction, the, the cause and effect. The, the cause happened to the, the fathers did it, but the effect came on the children. The fathers ate the grapes, the, the sour grapes, it didn't have any reaction, but the children's teeth like, whoa, whoa. They get the tingling feeling in their jaws because of what their fathers did. He says, the day is coming when they will no longer say that. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. In other words, Ezekiel goes back, and, and, and then now, they, now these people that Jeremiah is talking to, they go into captivity, and when Ezekiel's over there with them, and they're saying, well, you know, it's because of what our fathers did. And, and Ezekiel says, no, don't, no, that's not the case. God says... I will punish the one who sins. If, 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 a, if the father sins and the son changes his ways, I will spare the son. I'm not going to punish the son, well, because I can't forgive you because of what your father did. He says that's not the case. And so he has to explain that to the people. And again, just because he explains it to the people doesn't mean they go, oh, okay, because they're, they're, they're set. They're, they're, their mind is set. We know, and Ezekiel can explain it to them, and they just reject it and go their own way. Anyway, the day is coming. And then it says right here, verse 30, and said, everyone who will die for his own sin, whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Verse 31, the time is coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. Now, what covenant did he make with their forefathers? We're talking about the Mosaic covenant with their forefathers, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. I mean, I was right there with them, holding their hand, and they still rebelled against me. I mean, how much closer can I get? I've got you by the hand, I'm like a husband, I'm leading you out of slavery, and you rebel against me. He says, it, it's, that, 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 that's not going to work. I can't get close enough to these people. I, I, God is, is living with them. He's got a temple with them. He's given them step-by-step -step instructions on how to live, and they can't do it. He said, I took them by the hand, and they couldn't do it. He says, this is not going to work. We're going to have to make a change. <coughs> Verse 33, now again, realize the book of Hebrews picks this, these exact verses up, and it's right in the middle of the book of Hebrews that explains them because it, it say this is, this is what we've been waiting for. Because in the book of Hebrews, remember, some of the priests and some of the Israelites have, are drifting back. They've accepted Christ, but they're drifting back. They can't stop trusting in this. And the writer's telling them, listen, Jeremiah even told you we're going to leave this behind and come over to this new covenant because this will, will never save you. You can, you can learn from this. You can see future. We've got prophecy in this. We've got God's character within this. But you're not going to be able to respond to this the way you think you can. You can't say, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do that. You can learn from it, but you're not going to ever going to be able to obey. You've got to go to this new covenant. And that's in the book of Hebrews. But notice, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. Notice, after that time. Not in Jeremiah's day, but there's a day coming. He says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man, his brother, saying, Know the Lord. And that would be like a priest trying to say, You don't know him, but I know him. I'm a priest. It says, Because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. In other words, you're not going to be distant and have to go talk to a priest, and the priest would explain it to you. You're going to know the Lord. You won't even need a priest. You're going to be, well, that's, Peter talks about this, Jesus talks about this. You're going to be a priest. You're going to, know, you're going to be able to access the Lord yourself. Um, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, No, Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says. And again, how, how sure this? This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, 
who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish will my, from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. In other words, I'm going to bring them back, and you're going to have to destroy the entire planet before Israel no longer exists. Um, and it goes on and talks about that. So that's... Um, I'll just finish reading the chapter. This is what the Lord says, Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. In other words, there may be individuals get judged, but the nation itself, I'm going to save the nation. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for, for me from the Tower of Han Hanel, Hananel, to the corner gate, the measuring line will stretch from the straight, from there straight to the hill of Gar Garib, and then turn to Goa, the whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown, and all the terraces out to the Kidron Valley on, on the east, as far as the corner of the horse gate, will be holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. And again, they were talking about the whole valley where the dead bodies and ashes are. That, that is the Hinnom Valley where they're having child sacrifices and the King Josiah came, tore all that down, and it became a garbage dump. So all the way from the Hinnom Valley, which goes down the west side and hooks around the bottom, the south side of the city, connects with the Kidron Valley. He says all that is going to be holy to the Lord, and those again, and never again uprooted or demolished, which means that wasn't the Babylonian restoration. That, that, that has to be a thing in the future. Um, ch chapter 32, it's interesting, Jeremiah is in prison, but he, he, buys, he, he buys a field. He, he needs to buy a field because it's his lot. And it, it, what's interesting about that is he's prophesying destruction and doom to the people who are going to go into captivity, but it's his chance to buy the, the family farm. And instead of saying, oh, it's, it's worthless, it's, we're all going to be destroyed, he buys it because he knows, although you're going to go into captivity, this is going to be the inheritance. We're coming back here, so... Then they sign the they sign the scrolls. You know they sign one that everybody can read. Then they sign another one and seal it and put that in the bank or in a jar so that it will be the official document that says he owns this property. Now he's never going to possess it, but he buys it for the future because he knows it's his is his inheritance because they're coming back then. Which again is screaming a physical restoration because he's he's buying land for the future in the, these chapters. And that basically ends the book, of, not ends the book of Jeremiah, but that is the, the eschatology uh, in, in the book of Jeremiah. And you see some new things that are picked up in there. Uh, any questions on that as we rush through that? And again, we're just looking at, you know, the, the details of, of eschatology. Would you look at the uh, Jacob's trouble as being a great tribulation? Now, you mean the 70th week or yeah. the last three and a half years? The last year. Yeah. I, I would think because that first, if we divide that again, you know, if we divide that, and we saw this the other night, uh, during this, th there's the treaties made right here, and Israel's going to have temple worship from here up until right about here. And so Israel's going to have peace. While the whole, and they're worshiping, everything's fine, while the whole world is... The seals are being opened, and, and, a, and a fourth of the population dies. And there's famine. Israel's like, you know, woo hoo, everything's good, you know. And so this can't be considered Jacob's trouble because it's they're having they're having. It's when they realize the Antichrist comes into the temple that then they are told to flee, and they flee into the wilderness, and they're there for three and a half years. So this is three and a half years of of where they're persecuted, but yet they're they're protected for times, time, and half a time, even gives the number of days. So for three and a half years, they've got, if the way I would understand it, they're the 144,000 that are sealed and are protected while the wrath of God is being dumped down, you know, during the last three and a half years. So that's, yeah, it's it would be this time right here. Um, and there must be, you know, they're, they're protected. There must be some terrible things taking place there to Israel. When we saw Daniel, what's interesting in Daniel is Daniel talks about the saints. The saints, when the, when the, uh, the king who will come or the ruler who will come, which we would call the Antichrist, when he shows up, the saints are going to suffer for a times, time, and half a time. So that's three and a half years. So it's like 
the saints suffer during the first three and a half, and then Israel is, uh, is pursued by the dragon for a times, time and a half a time. And it really doesn't seem to be the same time period. It seems to be there's the saints while Israel's worshiping, and then they, the treaty's broken, and now there's time of Jacob's trouble, and this would be that, that time. If, and, and like Jeremiah talks about how bad it's going to be, so there must be some terrible times here for, for Israel. Um, if you're going to distinguish between Israel and the saints in the book of Daniel, you know, the saints would be the true believers, and, and Israel would be the nation. Again, you can be a believer in Jesus Christ and a saint and a member of the nation of Israel, obviously, like Paul and Peter. <laughs> But it is also possible to have a group of saints that would include Gentiles who believe in the Lord and are saved, and then have you also be, or have another group called Israel who doesn't know the Lord, doesn't know Jesus, um, and yet they're following the Mosaic law. So you've got the nation and the saints. And I think you can have two different groups there. But yeah, I would say that's the second half. All these things are subject to adjustment <laughs> as you continue to you know, study. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to go to Ezekiel. And we will not finish Ezekiel tonight because, you know, I mean, look at right there. Once you hit chapter <laughs> chapter 39, you know, your wall-to-wall -wall prophecy hitting chapter 39, you're going wall-to-wall. -wall. But we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 34. Again, Ezekiel's, again, a fantastic book, and I would really like to take time and teach through this. But, you know, he's... He's prophesying, he's in Babylon, and he's called, he sees the chariot of God, which I think is the sign of the Son of Man. You know, we talk about the sign of the Son of Man appears. I think what you're, the sign of the Son of Man is right there in chapter 1, when you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the, 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 the throne on the sea of glass with the cherubim carrying it, and then the one who sits on the throne looks like a man who calls, looks, talks to Ezekiel, calls him the Son of Man, calls Ezekiel the Son of Man. And so, I, and that's clearly the Lord who's, you know, manifest. He's left, and if you go to chapter, that's in Babylon, chapter one and two. You see that chariot on the glass, the sea of glass in Babylon by the river. But if you go to chapter ten of Ezekiel, that very same uh, chariot on the sea of glass leaves, rises up out of the uh, the most holy place, out of the ark of the covenant and comes to the front of the temple over the threshold and gives some directions to some angels, and then the glory, which is it's called now called the glory of the Lord, leaves the temple. And that's in uh, chapter 10 and 11, where, uh, the, in fact, chapter 10, verse 18, then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple. It already left the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, and had come to the front of the temple. It was at the main gate between the two pillars, Jacob and Boaz, on that front, you know, the threshold coming out the front door of the temple. While I watched the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house. So on the east gate, they went to the east gate on the east side. And... Uh, and, and the glory of the of God of Israel was above the cherubim. And then he, he says in that same chapter that um, that this was the same thing he saw when the book began. So this is all things taking place in his day and visions that he's seeing. Um, he's chewing the people out, chapter 13. He's chewing out the prophets. He's, chapter 14, he's chewing out the people for idolatry. Uh, chapter 15, it's titled Jerusalem, the Useless Vine. Chapter 16 uh, talks about the unfaithfulness of Jerusalem and how they were supposed to be a faithful wife and they become wicked. He compares them to other unfaithful cities. I mean, just chewing on them, ripping on them. Uh, chapter 19 is titled Lament for Israel's Princes. Chapter 20, Rebellious Israel. It just, it's just, oh, chapter 23. Well, chapter 22 is called Jerusalem's Sins. And then chapter 23 goes back to... Uh, uh, talking about idol or, or, or adultery, where the, it's the two adulterous sisters, and the two adulterous sisters are, you can see them named there, Ohola and Oholi of Oholi, Oholi Ba. Oholi Ba. Uh, anyway, one is the, the, the Samaria, and the other is Jerusalem. Samaria's already been taken captive, now Jerusalem's going to be taken captive. Uh, he continues to then choose out. 
Tyre, choose out Egypt, chapter 29, chapter 30 is Egypt. And we come up to now chapter 34. And in chapter 34, Israel's faithless shepherds. Now he's going to take, this would be in the year, and again, what's nice about this is you've got dates in this. So if you go to chapter, oh, let's say 30, is it 32, 33? I'm looking for the date. At the, well, it's chapter 32, verse 1. In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day, the word of the Lord came to me. That's March 3rd, 585. I mean, that's, that's what's nice about that. They're dating the prophecies. And then later on in that chapter, it, it gives you the day. Yeah, chapter 32, verse 17. In the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. So you've got these dates. So the year is 585. And, and this 585 BC. Now you understand what year this is. 585 is the year after 586. And 586 is the year uh, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. So what you're having in 585, you've had an influx of captives. I mean, they, they, they've gone on the death march from Jerusalem. Jeremiah was in that, was chained in that camp of, on their way to Babylon. And uh, they came by, the, the generals were looking for Jeremiah, and they found him, and said, Nebuchadnezzar wants you set free. And wants, he said, I, he wants you to come with him to Babylon and, and be his guest in the palace. But he says, if you want to stay here, you can stay here. What, what, what do you want to do, Jeremiah? Jeremiah said, you know, stay here. And again, that's a, that's a great, fun story. But he was just north of Jerusalem, up there on a, a, where the hills continue to rise just north of Jerusalem, uh, Gibeah, the high places of Gibeah. He was up in that area, chained up with all the other captives, getting ready to take off for Babylon. Well, he was taken out of that train, and everyone else then marched. And so in 585, the captives have, have just arrived in Babylon. So in 585 B.C., uh, Jeremiah's, or Ezekiel now, he, he went, remember, he, Ezekiel went, arrived in 597. He was taken in the second captivity. Nebuchadnezzar took a bunch of the craftsmen and, and, the, and the artisans to help him build his cities. Um, but anyway, uh, Jer Ezekiel has seen and heard the false prophets, the false teachers, in you know 585, even when he was in Jerusalem. But now in chapter 34, as you see on the notes right here, I just write this, verses 1 through 10, Israel's faithless shepherds of 585 is contrasted with Israel's true shepherd who is coming in the future. So in these first, first 11 verses, I'll just read through them very quickly, and you're going to have the introduction, like we saw Jeremiah talk about the righteous king compared to the false kings, the wicked kings, Zedekiah, Jehoiakim, uh, you're going to have a true king, a righteous king, who's going to be the Lord our righteousness. Well, now, the shepherd, it says, chapter 34, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Again, that would be the governmental leaders. It could include, you know, the prophets and the priests. A prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Again, this is typical of a fourth generation governmental system or leadership. If it be the government, if it be the religious system, they're in their position of power. They can only feed themselves like they talk. I, 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 you know, I don't want to get political. But, you know, it's just so, for me it's just so obvious, you know. It's like everybody wants to see... Uh, uh, Trump's tax records. Like we would, how, how do you, how do you make so much money? It's like, well, he's a private businessman. That's how. I mean, that's what he does. He's a, he's a businessman. But now, what you want to see is the tax records of the politician who became a millionaire. It's like, yeah. it's like, it'd be like if I was a multi-millionaire shop teacher. It'd be like, wait a minute. Well, we want to see you right now. No, no, I, I, you don't need to see my tax record. Yeah, we do because there's no. You don't make enough. Like I tell the kids. I said, I tell him, I says, is there any way I can become, I give him a little lesson in starting a business. The difference between going to college and becoming a shop teacher or not going to college and starting a construction business or any kind of a business and starting to hire people to work for you because now you're paying them to work for you, you know, whatever you pay them, but then whatever they do, you're making money on what they're doing. So you're getting all, and I show them how if you all work for me and I'd pay you, and I tell them how much I'd pay them and we have this little product we make. And uh, they, they'd be really, yeah, that'd be great. It'd be a lot of money. I said, now we're going to sell it for this much. Yeah, oh, that's all right. I said, now I'm going to get that. So you made, you know, this much money. And now I made that much money too. And you made this much money, but I made that much money too. So you all made, you know, $200, but I made two, four, six. I made, it's like, and all of a sudden it's like, 
Well, that's not fair. <laughs> it's like, I says, so you don't want to get a job and work for You don't want to go, because I had to hire someone to be, uh, take care of my books. So you went to college, I, you took care of my books. I had to hire someone to do this, and you went, you went and got a degree, and I, I paid you. It's like, so you don't want to work for somebody. You want to own the business. It's like, and you just see, there's two or three kids always going, oh, yeah, you, <laughs> you can go grind out an hourly living, or you can own a business. And I use that example. Uh, oh, and then I say, then I tell, I said, now I says, is there any way, or I, will, I make this, I said, I will never be a millionaire as a shop teacher. I says, is that, is that right? And then the, the kids are all, you know, they have the work ethic and the save money and they go, well, no, you, you, if you, if you, uh, if, if you saved your money, if you, you know, you, you could be a millionaire, you just can't spend your money. I says, listen. If I if I just lived in a box, if I just lived here in the shop and just slept on my desk, they don't put enough money in my checking account over a 20, 30 year period to even equal a million dollars. I'm not going to get a million dollars from the school my whole career. So I will. I said I will never be a millionaire because I'm a shop teacher. And so, like, well, you could win the lottery. I said, but that's not because I'm not get that. Would that be outside? I will never be a millionaire as a school teacher. It's impossible. The math isn't, doesn't work out. You're going to have to go somewhere else and become a millionaire. So the whole point, going back to this, is if I was a millionaire as a shop teacher, it's like, we want to see your records. Where, how are you, where did you get this million dollars from? And the same thing, we know what the politicians get paid. How, did, how in the world did you become a millionaire? It's like, what? That, that's mathematically impossible. Well, I, I got people giving me money. Okay, who, who's giving you money? That means you're working for them. I mean, so, I mean, but nonetheless, that's what the same thing here. Woe to the shepherds who only, again, that, that was a, not a political statement as much as it was, that is exactly what's being said here. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. In other words, they're eating the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. That's the fourth generation, destroying the needy among them. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they are scattered because there, there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. You can consider that crime. My sheep wandered over all the mountains, and on every high hill they were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Now, a good leader would not do, let that happen. They would take care of the sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, or sovereign Yahweh, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered, and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than the flock, therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds, and will hold them accountable for all my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock, so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and it will no longer be food for them. Again, notice right here, we're talking about two things. This is not saying, again, going back to our whole illustration, we've been talking about this whole time, this is not saying the sheep are innocent. Because if we just took the sheep by themselves, they themselves have a sin nature. We're talking about the sheep who have a sin nature, and God has established leadership to help guide and protect the people with sin natures to a safe location. But now the leadership's sin nature has taken over, and now they're devouring instead of overseeing it, uh, they're using the sheep. So in other words, you've got a sin nature problem with the sheep, but if you put leaders in, ch in charge of the sheep, now the leaders have to be careful of their sin nature because they're going to start using the sheep for their own advantage. So I mean, sin nature, just it's not saying the sheep are innocent. It's saying the shepherds were given a responsibility as an institution to protect the sheep, and they turned it on themselves. Verse 11, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep. I, and those right here, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are, were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them 
out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains. And notice what he's, I'm going to do this. So this is talking about now the righteous. I'm going to do it the right way. I'm not going to find someone to do it. I'm not going to hire someone. I will come and be the shepherd. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in the settlements in the lands. I will tend them on a, in, in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. They will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend the sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. And the sleek and the strong are sleek and strong because they've been the ones abusing the sheep. I will shepherd the flock with justice. As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another. Now this is another good run of verses here. But you understand what he's saying right there. It's, he's not saying I'm going to go find somebody. I'm going to come do this myself. Once again, the incarnation. Um, as for my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will judge between one sheep and another, and between rams and goats. It is not enough for you to feed on the good pastures, must you also trample the rest of the pasture with your feet. It is not enough for you to drink clear water, must you also muddy the water. Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and, and, and drink that you have muddy? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, uh, because you shove the, their flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away. I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. In other words, there's going to be people within in Israel that are abusing the other people, and, and he's not going to save them. He's going to judge them. Now watch this. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, I've got this written down in my notes, verse 37, 24, and 44, 3, in this, in this book also, brings up the idea. Notice he says, there, he's going to be their king. I'll be their Lord. He's going, to be the, he's going to clearly be the God of the world, or the king of the world. But David is going to be the prince that serves under him. And again, that's going to come up. That's going to be a theme in the book of Ezekiel that we're going to have to decide, is this really David? And is, if it is, it's going to have to be uh, David coming back at, at the resurrection. Um, I've got chapter 36, 1 through 7, uh, the restoration. It says, so the son of, man, son of man, now notice right here, and again, I think this is important because you see, he calls Ezekiel son of man. He calls him son of man. And I, and I said this, you know, the other night in Bible study too, but Jesus in Matthew 24 says the sign of the Son of Man will be like lightning. You know, don't look for the Messiah in the wilderness. Don't look for him in the inner rooms. But like lightning from east to the west will be the sign of the Son of Man. Now, when you say the sign of the Son of Man, I mean, and, and Jesus calls himself Son of Man. So, I mean, it's easy and I think it's right to think that the sign of the Son of Man is the Messiah appearing. Everybody sees him, you know, like the second coming. He appears in the sky. It's the sign of the Son of Man. But at the same time, it, it, it's just, I can't go past it because right here, he calls Ezekiel throughout this book, Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. That's what he calls him. And what did Ezekiel, the Son of Man, see? He, the book begins with him seeing the chariot coming in and one sitting on it like looked like a man. So it, it, it's, like I've said before, it's like either way you look at it, the one sitting on the throne for the sign of the Son of Man is the Son of Man. But when Ezekiel sees the Son of Man sitting on the throne oh, with a sea of glass, the Son of Man calls Ezekiel Son of Man. So the sign that Ezekiel saw, or the sign that the Son of Man saw, was the chariot. So, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's what Ezekiel saw, or it's what Jesus is when he appears on that throne. Does that make sense, what I'm, what I'm trying to say? It's like when it, Jesus says... Uh, the sign of the Son of Man, is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about what Ezekiel saw? The world's going to see the same thing. And Ezekiel was the only one who saw this chariot, but the day is coming when the whole world is going to see the chariot, when the whole world's going to see what the Son of Man saw. So, nonetheless. Chapter 36, this is just, again, restoration of Israel. It's repeat. Uh, chapter 36, verse 1 through 11. Son of Man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Now here we go. This is now we're getting to eschatology and we're going to have to quit for tonight. 
uh, speak to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The enemy said of you, Aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Okay, see that right there? Israel's become our possession. The enemy has it. Therefore prophesy and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because they ravaged and hounded you from every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and the object of people's malicious talk and slander. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Sovereign Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys, to the desolate ruins and the deserted towns that have been plundered and ridiculed by the rest of the nations around you. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. In my burning zeal I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. For with glee and with malice in their hearts they made my land their own possession so that they might plunder its pasture land. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and save the mountains and the hills to the ravines and the valleys. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I speak in my jealous wrath because you have suffered the scorn of the nations. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I swear with uplifted hand that the nations around you will also suffer scorn. And, I mean, you can't make it any more clear. I mean, he's making it a statement. I am going to do this thing. And it's, it's his, his, his wrath. It's his, his, his passion. It's his zeal. But you, O mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people Israel. For they will soon come home, and I am concerned for you, and will look on you with favor. You will be plowed and sown, and I will multiply the number of people among upon you. And he goes through and talks about, again, the restoration of, of, of uh, um, Israel. I'm just looking over here in verse, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Again, I do not think this is coming out. Of, I mean, they're going to come out of Babylonian captivity, but this is bigger than Babylonian captivity return because they went into Roman dispersion after that. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I Meaning he's, he's not just going to give them a law. He's going to cleanse them. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That's Jeremiah 31. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I mean, we're talking about being born again. He's got, he says, I'm going to bring you back, but before I bring you back, I've got to change you. But before I change you, I've got to pay the price for your sin. The, 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 the suffering servant has to go forward so he can become the Lord our righteousness, so he can become the good shepherd and bring you back in land. All these things have to have a sequence. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. See, not going to save you from your enemies, but I'm going to save you from your sin. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful. I will increase the fruit. It goes on and talks about all the blessings that are coming. And that leaves a great place to stop. And we come right up to uh, uh, chapter 37. And that's where the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel says, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth. There's just a bunch of dead, or dried up bones. I mean, not just dead bodies. I mean, the, the bodies are gone. The bones are dry. They're not even in skeletal formation. There's just bones scattered. And he's going to ask him, you know, as you know, can these bones live again? Because that, what's going to happen to Israel, they're going to be so far gone. They're going to be so dead, not just dead, but decayed. No flesh on their bones. And not just a skeleton, but just, I mean, scattered skeletons. Not even a skeleton laying on the ground, but bones from skeletons. I mean, just scattered in this, fallen down in this valley, and dry. I mean, it's, they've been dead for years, centuries. And it's like, can, can this come back to life? And then he goes, and then he gets, and all of a sudden the whole thing starts coming together. And all it is is just, it's, in a sense, it's the retelling of what we've already said, the restoration of Israel. But you're going to get more, more uh, details. And if you look right there, that's chapter 37. Look at chapter 37, 38, 39, 40, all the way up to 48. We've got 11 chapters of, the, of, of, of Israel's return. And many things are going to take place. I mean, it gets to be crazy. In fact, you're going to have, and of course we didn't get to it, 
and again, it, it's not necessarily going to be taught, explained, you know, linear, where it's just, it's a real, go straight, it's like one chapter after another. You're going to cycle to the end and come back, you're going to give it more detail, you're going to be going back and forth through this information. In chapter 38 39, there's this battle of, of, of Gog, and this is what this map is. Again, this is my map. It's not necessarily the correct map. You know, we've got the Bible verses, we've got the story, and this is me trying to put it together. And I've, I've done some study, many people have, and there's details there about a, a great battle. And then you got to decide when this battle takes place. In, and it's going to be the future. It's, it's not Rome, it's not Babylon. It's never happened. This battle has never happened. But it's a turning point in history. Does it happen before the tribulation? Does it happen during the tribulation? Does it, is it the battle of Armageddon at the end? Or even at, in the millennial kingdom at the end of a thousand years, you know, Gog marches against Jerusalem again. Is, is that this battle? So anyway, that's going to come up in great detail. Tells you the countries, tells you the, the battle, tells, you, tells us where they bury the bodies. Tells us how long it takes to clean the land up because of all the dead bodies that were scattered. So I mean, that all that all fits together. And we get more and more details. So I'll pray. And if you got any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask them or anything you want to say or corrections, insights you have yourself. Father, we do thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word and ask that we do handle these things correctly. We thank you for these words of encouragement that we can count on you, that there is a future and there is a hope. And Father, we ask that we might be made strong at this time in history, that we may walk in your ways and do the things you've called us to at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I have to apologize. It was Sister's Weekend, and so uh, my wife was gone partying with all the old ladies, <laughs> and uh, so there's no snacks tonight. I mean, well, you really <laughs> dropped the ball. I know. I know. It's like, like we were talking before class. She's got three sisters. They all used to be these. I remember, you know. When they, you know one of them was just was married, you know, and one was in junior high, and they're all these little girls, and and then you know they they had their families, and they started getting together many years ago. They get together once a year. The four ladies would leave their families, and they'd hang out with their mom. And their mom was you know a, a young girl of 55 or something, and you know you kind of had to watch what they did. You know they're young young kids. Well now you know we we still we still think that way. But yeah. I, I, when she got back, I was talking to her. When they got back, it's like you know, well, well that was five grandmas out. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, the sisters weekend. The sisters get together. It's like they they go out there's a and there's a one's a great grandma and the other the four daughters are all grandmas themselves. With you know, Tammy, how many grandkids? Is, Tony, how many grandkids does Tammy have? Tammy has thirteen. Thirteen grandkids. Wow. And so it's like. Wait, this, this isn't what it used to be. This, and so, they're a wild weekend. It, it, it leaves a dead. It leaves a dead. Some of them stayed up till they're like probably, 10. They're probably they, celebrating they, if they stayed up till 9. Yeah, exactly. Some of them stayed up till 10, 10 30. You know, like, <laughs> crazy times. But yeah, but we're paying the price tonight. She's like, oh. <laughs>